Hello again, doctors, and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're continuing on with our series on parasites with the GIT pathogen Entamoeba histolytica. This includes microbiology, pathology, and pharmacology. All my sources and timestamps will be listed down below, so without further ado, grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. So we are in the phyla amoeba zone, aka Sarcodina, who fall here on my overall list of parasites. So let's go over a typical amoebic life cycle, which consists of two forms, the cyst and trophozoite. Cysts are the dormant form, and they're either double or triple walled, and they're highly resistant to environmental stresses, allowing them to exist outside their host. Now, trophozoite is the mobile form, which allows for reproduction and feeding, and they are highly adaptable to their environment. Now, if a trophozoite is presented with an environment that it cannot adapt to, like changes in pH, overcrowding, lack of food, it will undergo encystation, or encyst, and become its cyst dormant form. It basically secretes its thick wall around itself to protect itself, enabling it to survive longer. Likewise, when environmental conditions allow and become favorable, the cyst form will undergo existation, and the trophozoids inside will escape through the central pore and break free, allowing for mobility, reproduction, and feeding. All right, let's start off with the names of all the amoebas that are covered on step one, starting off with Balamuthia mandriaris, Acanthamoeba polyphaga, Nigleria fowleri, and Entamoeba histolytica. We can remember it with the mnemonic Bane. Both from Batman and the fact that they are the bane of our existence, they're very hard to diagnose and even harder to treat. And today we will be focusing on the GIT amoeba, which is Entamoeba histolytica, who mainly afflicts the large intestine and liver. Now we all know the phrase of medicine, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Well, all of the amoebas are on your list of zebras, especially Entamoeba because he is not endemic to the United States. Starting off with the etiology, Entamoeba histolytica is a free-living amoeba, mainly found in water and on moist food. His cyst form is not extremely resistant to environmental factors and can only survive outside the host for a few weeks. As with all GIT parasites, the route of entry is ingestion, in this case of the mature cyst, from infected feces in water or prone food. The major risk factor is going to be travel to the endemic regions or immigrants from there. Regardless, extremes of age are particularly vulnerable, so they're very young or they're very old. And there's a rising body of evidence showing that anal intercourse increases your risk of contraction. For the epidemiology, according to the CDC, there are 480 million people affected worldwide, with 100,000 people dying annually from the disease. Morphologically, the cyst form is spherical and visibly contains to four nuclei. The histrovozoi, or mobile form, cysts in the small intestine and is also quadrinucleated. Diagnosis for entamoeba is always going to be on stool OMP, where you can see mature, multinucleated cysts. Trophozoids are possible, but they won't survive in the sample for very long. And as with any stool OMP, it's very important to take multiple samples to reduce your risk of a false negative. There are three overall pathologies that we need to know for E. histolytica. The first one being local disease, where the trophozoids just remain in the colon, replicating, encysting, maturing, and passing cysts through stool. Second, there's the invasive form, where the trophozoids penetrate the mucus layer of the gut, make contact with the mucosa, bore holes in phagocytized tissue, causing overt bleeding. And in 10% of cases, the trophozoids can gain access to the systemic blood supply and disseminate most commonly to the liver, causing the amoebic liver abscess. And regardless of the pathology, mature cysts are passed through stool. For local amoebiasis, the pathogenesis starts after we ingest the mature cyst, which each contain a multinucleated trophozoite which exists once they get to the small intestine. Then each one of the trophozoids nuclei divide, yielding at least eight trophozoids per cyst. Those trophozoids then migrate to the large intestine, where they cause local amoebiasis. The newly migrated trophozoids then multiply by binary fission within the lumen of the large intestine. Those newly formed trophozoids then end cysts and mature to become multinucleated before being passed in feces in order to repeat the cycle. Now this is the common pathway that occurs regardless of the person's clinical presentation. They will always pass mature cysts in their feces. And while residing in the lumen, these amoebas feed on bacteria and food particles by secreting lytic enzymes. The clinical presentation will range from asymptomatic carriers who are simply passing mature cysts in their stools, to people who present with mild disease, which will consist of persistent diarrhea and possible weight loss, fatigue, and mild abdominal pain. And the presentation typically takes a few weeks after ingestion. Diagnosis will always be on stool OMP, where you will observe quadri or multinucleated round cysts and trophozoids are possible, but remember they won't last long in the sample itself. And always remember to take multiple samples. Treatment options will depend upon the clinical presentation. With your asymptomatic carriers, the drug of choice is paramomycin, which is an aminoglycoside antibiotic. And the alternative is iodoquinol, 
and the O is highlighted due to the side effect of optic neuritis for long-term use. And for your patients presenting with mild disease, so persistent diarrhea, the drug of choice again is paromomycin, however you add metronidazole, with your metronidazole alternatives being tenidazole, tetracycline, and erythromycin. And finally, some other parasites to keep on your list of differentials. First off would be Giardia, because that is endemic to the United States, typically among people who like to camp or hike. Second are your GIT sporozones, so Cyclosporidium, Cryptosporidium, and Cystoisospora belli, who are typically found in your HIV AIDS patients. And finally, your GIT helminths, and especially the cestodes, aka tapeworms, and GIT nematodes, or roundworms. And now for amoebic dysentery. So dysentery starts off with localized disease becoming invasive. So when the trophozoids are able to penetrate that mucus barrier in the large intestine and make contact with the epithelia. This attachment is mediated by the protein lectin on histolytica cell surface and allows histolytica to invade the mucosal lining. But remember, it's secreting lytic enzymes in order to digest its food. Well, it starts to do that to our tissues, causing ulcerations and bleeding. This bleeding is going to lead to occult blood, aka hematochesia. And it's also going to lead to what's called flask-shaped lesions on colonic biop biopsy. This is the major buzzword to remember. And as you can see, the ulcerations do resemble a flask. Another possible outcome due to the immune response can be a granulomatous reaction, and that's termed a myeloma. So for the pathogenesis, remember flask-shaped lesions in the colon for amoebic dysentery, which is invasive disease. So we have invaded the tissue. However, we haven't broken into the bloodstream just yet. The clinical presentation for dysentery is marked by the persistent bloody diarrhea and severe abdominal cramping, which makes it unique to the other two presentations that we've talked about. This, of course, can be accompanied by weight loss and fatigue. However, the complications are important to know because especially in kids, remember this affects the extremes of age usually, kids are at risk for intussusception, necrotizing enterocolitis, and perforation, with perforation presenting with an acute abdomen. For diagnosis, besides stool OMP, you will observe fecal occult blood or microscopic. And on biopsy, remember the flask-shaped lesions in colonic mucosa. For treatment options, the drug of choice is actually the same that it is for mild disease with paromomycin with metronidazole. Same alternatives for metronidazole. And if your patient is non-responsive, you can add emetine or dehydroemetine, which are your systemic agents. Your differential diagnosis list should include other pathogens that are responsible for dysentery, like Shigella and Balantinium coli. And finally, we've come to systemic amoebiasis. This occurs when invasive disease becomes disseminated by gaining access to the blood supply. Now, since it's found in the GIT, it should make sense that the first blood supply it gains access to is to the portal venous circulation, where he can disseminate feeding on erythrocytes, and you can actually pick him up on peripheral blood smear with engulfed RBCs in its cytoplasm. Once he disseminates, he's able to form abscesses in multiple organs, and due to portal venous circulation, the number one place that this occurs is in the liver leading to an abscess formation in the right lobe more commonly. And this typically occurs in kids with the male to female ratio being 10 to 1. The other systems it can disseminate to in decreasing likelihood is the lung, spleen, and brain. The most common clinical presentation is for the liver abscess, and your patient will present with right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. Other possibilities are fever, abdominal pain, and bloating, but your main clue is that right upper quadrant pain and possibly fever. Diagnosis, can you guess? Stool OMP, where you will observe mature quadri or multinucleated cysts, and you can confirm this on CT or MRI, where you will observe a solid uniform density, usually in the right lobe. Blood serology is always possible. However, within a liver abscess case, you can also observe leukocytosis and elevated liver enzymes. Now, in terms of testable topics, the biopsy or gross examination is a high yield point to remember because the abscess will actually be filled with an anchovy-like paste exudate. As that picture shows, that small cassette on the left contains anchovy paste, and the one on the right contains drained fluid from an amoebic abscess. Now for treatment options for dysentery, it will always include all three classes of drugs. So promomycin for your luminal agent, metronidazole with its alternatives for your mixed agents, and chloroquine for your systemic agents. And again, the alternatives for chloroquine are dehydroemetine and emetine. And finally, for your differential diagnoses, they should include the pathogens that can also cause a liver abscess. Most commonly, in the parasitic family, it will be a chenococcus. However, that abscess will be multiloculated. And the main bacterial causes are strep and staph. And just for the record, surgery in this case is contraindicated due to the risk of rupture, which would cause acute anaphylaxis. So treatment is solely medicinal. And now for an overview of the entire life cycle, which starts off with ingestion of a mature cyst. Once those mature cysts reach the small intestine, the trophozoids within excyst, nuclei divide, and those daughter trophozoids then migrate to the large intestine to undergo binary fission. 
those daughter trophozoites then exist, mature, and are then passed through feces in order to repeat the cycle. Remember, this is the common pathway that happens regardless of the presentation, and when it remains localized to the large intestine, it gives your asymptomatic to mild disease. This can then progress to invasive disease, where the trophozoites make contact with the mucosa and cause those flask-shaped lesions, as well as bloody stool. The disease can continue to progress, with those trophozoites making right into systemic circulation, usually the portal venous, making their new home in our liver, where they can form an amoebic abscess, typically in the right lobe, filled with that anchovy paste-like exudate. And finally, for the pharmacology summary, you can skip this part if you're not in farm. But for those of you who are, we have three classes of drugs for anti-amoebics. We have luminal agents, mixed agents, and systemic agents. For the luminals, the mnemonic that I used to use was take a dip in the lumen with DIP, standing for diloxinide furoate, iodoquinol, and peromomycin. Now, diloxinide is crossed out because it's actually not available in the U.S., but if it was, it would be the drug of choice for all three pathologies. Iodoquinol, again, the O is highlighted because it causes optic neuritis with long-term use, and peromomycin is bolded with a star because it's mainly the drug of choice in terms of luminal agents. For your mixed category, the mnemonic I use is literally that M-I-X-T, with the M standing for metronidazole and the T standing for tinidazole. Tinidazole is in the same drug class as metronidazole, however, has a much better side effect profile. And finally, for our systemic agents, I used to think to chloroclean the system, like with Clorox bleach, with chlorocline or chloroquine being the drug of choice for your systemic agents. And your backups are emetine and dehydroemetine. So if you just remember chloroclean D system, you can remember D and E for dehydroemetine and emetine. And they actually go in order from left to right in terms of additional drug therapy, giving your luminal agents to your patients with mild to moderate disease or even asymptomatic carriers, adding a mixed agents if invasive disease is possible, so metronidazole. And then finally, if it's disseminated or non-responsive, you can add your systemic agent, which is chloroquine. Okay, doctor, we made it to the end, not only in this video, but in my series on amoebas. I will link my video on CNS amoebas next. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you stay tuned to my channel if you want more videos on parasites. Smash that huge thumbs up if you found this video helpful. Good luck studying, and I, of course, will see you on the next one. I just had to let you know you're